being here. Este evento lo podemos hacer en Spanglish. Eh, my name is Adela Pineda. I am the director of the Lozano Teresa Long Institute of Latin American Studies, better known as LILAS. We are very thankful for your presence. This is more of like a small discussion on a book, but this book is really a long-standing project. And I think as LILAS having a partnership with the Benson, and as LILAS as a hub of interdisciplinary studies, um, in which the Department of History is very well represented here, um, the Fulbright scholars and our visiting scholars, and, uh, uh, that shows that um, Projects like this are important. This project was a, a collaboration between several universities in Mexico, the US. Oh, no. Um, I was just saying that this, this, this project started as a collaboration between several scholars whose, whose affiliation are in, in Europe, in the United States, and in Mexico, uh, and other countries. And it was sponsored by, um, Diana is going to explain better, but you see next, who's at the University of California System and UNAM. Because we do things similar here at UT Austin, because we have so many collaborations with Mexican institutions, many of you have participated, we thought this was the right context. Because we have a great library like the Benson, because I know that many of the collaborators of this book use some of the materials housed at the Benson, because I know that Jana, who is the co-editor of this book, was going to come as a, as a visiting scholar to, to use the Benson, we thought that this was the perfect setting to talk to you about this project. <coughs> we would like you to intervene, discuss, engage with us as we present the book. Let me say a few words only about Jana and Amy, my colleague Amy, who is also a collaborator of the book. Um, the, uh, Amy and I were invited, but Hannah and, and, and the other professor who co-edited the book, um, Vivian Mahieu at UC um, Irvine, Irvine. Uh, to collaborate in this book. So um, Diana is an Ecuadorian-Mexican. We don't know if she's more Ecuadorian than Mexican <laughs> at this point, because she's been in Mexico many years, and is a full research professor at the Centro de Estudios Literarios at UNAM. Uh, uh, where she has like put together many research projects, collectives, and led several dissertations, several student groups, and also work on major scholarly projects, such as Narradores Mexicanos de Vanguardia, Hernández Novo, Ove Nivela, en los años 20. She um, has compiled uh, the Chronicles of a Guatemalan writer who is also well known in literary studies, Arqueles Vela, and um, has a PhD from UNAM, among many other degrees. Amy Wright is visiting us from um, San Luis, Missouri, mm -hmm. where she is an associate professor of Hispanic studies at the University of San Luis. And she got a PhD from Brown University and has uh, is her, her book on um, um, Serial Mexico Storytelling Across Media from Nationhood to Now is forthcoming in Vanderbilt University Press. She uh, just won a major national endowments for the humanities fellowship, uh, so congratulations, Thank Amy. You. And um, she's also going to be discussing the book. So thank you to both of you thank and you. to our very well-informed audience to be here. Thanks for um, having us. Jana, I let you speak. Okay, um, thank you so much. I'm going to pass the book around so that you see it. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Adela, to Paloma, to the Lilas project, and of course to Amy for coming here. I'm going to present the book as I Adela told, it's more a project than a book. It's a five years history after 
uh, with a, a, a lockdown, maybe more. <laughs> but in terms of uh, resources, we had a UC Nexus Conacit uh, founds uh, wind with uh, Vivian Mayu, and uh, we had a, a possibility, the immense possibility to um, invite some scholars we knew, sometimes just reading their works, not even in person, to collaborate to a totally uh, interdisciplinary uh, book. Because we thought cultures of the press coming, Vivian and I, from literature studies, involved a lot more uh, disciplines, such as uh, history of the press, history of art, visual arts, visual studies. So we had a, um, in, including, including uh, comparative literature. And we have uh, written this book um, and edited this book. The problem, major problem was editing. It was, uh, as we started, we wanted it to be, to cover a period between 1880 and 1930, and it had more reason to be till 1940 after Lázaro Cárdenas' government uh, ended. It covers the start of the Mexican modern press, and it holds an introduction and 18 chapters separated on six parts. The parts I'm going to talk a little more about the first three parts because it makes more sense in this uh, space and audience. There are visuality and intermediality, that's the first one. We have here the two collaborators in person. Uh, the second one, perspectives on the popular. The third one, Mexico and the US. Maybe it's a little uh, speedy that you have the book. And uh, the fourth is press and literature. The fifth, two words, industrial journalism. And the sixth, between atavisms, atavisms and innovation. The first part, as we conceived, visuality and intermediality. We don't, didn't want this book to be chronological, but also Inter uh, topics, intermedial, inter academia. So it includes uh, chapters of Adela Pineda Franco, Miguel Navitsky, and Amy E. Wright. I am referring more to real chapters since my collaborators and friends are here. And professor of the University of Georgia, Navitsky proposes cartoon drawings as remediation of cinema on Mexico City Press from 1900 till 1930. This means cinema was the media reference for newspaper design or Miss and Pash. Same uh, if there weren't really designers prepared for the office, they all were watching movies and copying the way they could to transmit from one media, cinema, to the newspaper media, to the mass media, uh, the way stories were told in succession, simulating past time uh, moves. And uh, they were self-taught design pioneers who tried to reproduce film sequences with drawing, drawings or photographs. Actuality, modernness were metaphorized by cinema those days, the coincidence of Mexican Revolution and cinema exhibition and production in Mexico intensified, as you can see, this process of remediation, as called after David Bolter and Richard Grossin uh, book of 1999. Then we have the second part, that's the perspectives on the popular. Maybe that could be... Uh, sustained also in English, but in Spanish, popular has two main significates, one being um, vinculated to folklore, 
and the other one being vinculated with massive audiences. So uh, we were playing with both concepts with this word. Um, it includes the work of Pablo Zavala, Sergio Ugalde, and Andrea Rodriguez. Professor Zavala, nowadays Loyola University in New Orleans professor, uh, compares the representation of the people, el pueblo, and the popular, the popular, as collective subjectivity in two coexistence, coexistent publications, El Universal Ilustrado and El Machete, between 1917 and 1925. Uh, the one, El Ilustrado, is a widely known weekly magazine bestseller in, the, in Mexico City on that period, and El Machete is the Mexican Communist Party newspaper. The use of the public space in modern Mexico is especially underlined in his text, because Zavala emphasizes the opposition uh, in the representation of the masses and the masses the popular demonstrations, the strikes, as positive, as a right um, in El Machete, and negative in El Universal. It uh, has a connection with what was called, in, at least in Spanish, la cuestión social. The, I don't know if subject it's question. Question, question yeah. uh, which uh, was uh, thought as big cities corrupted people. So there was always a problem from migrating because vicious uh, groups were going to corrupt the new commerce. And that is a consistent concept from Porfiriato to after revolution, even if one doesn't, doesn't think so. so it was, uh, in these photographs, it was represented uh, as massive presence was, in El Universal, uh, dangerous. So the public space um, should be not so crowded, not so minacious. And pictures, text, cinema, artistic images reinforce that concept. And uh, the opposite was in El Machete, who shared a concept of the right of the masses to be, because that was their revolution. And uh, Mexican Revolution, as we know, is being widely metaphorized uh, from then to our days by images of masses in cinema murals and wood prints. So there's a tension, and he describes it. Then Professor Sergio Ugalde of El Colegio de México concentrates on a later period, the 30s to 40s, when the Partido Nacional Revolucionario, PNR, to nowadays PRI, had become official party in Mexico and had a daily newspaper called El Nacional, which was the official organ of Mexican government. And Sergio Galde traces the columns of a poet, uh, Efraín Huerta. It's a contemporary, total contemporary of Octavio Paz. Um, and he traces these uh, columns written between 1939 and 1944. And the column was called El Hombre de la Esquina with this H and this E, hombre, esquina, as in Efraín Huerta, as an acronym. Um, and during those years, agit years of anti-fascism and war, um, Huerta managed to publish about a thousand contributions on that column, and many them, of them were dedicated not to politics, but to poetry. That was uh, something important to highlight because um, what to do as an artist in those times, that was a, the alternative to brutality seemed to be poetry. And they had 
a main figure of literature engagé that time was Chilean poet Pablo Neruda, diplomat in Mexico from 1940 to 1943. So a lot of these columns were defending the presence of Pablo Neruda, who was sometimes attacked even by Nazis in Mexico at uh, festivals and readings. And then Andrea Rodriguez, we are very proud of her because she was our scholar, uh, fulfilling the doctoral uh, courses, and now is working for a museum as curator in Franz Mayer. She explores another perspective on popular culture by following a publication which was a failure experience but an extraordinary case of interest for cultures of the press. Conozca usted a México. Conozca usted a México had only seven numbers edited monthly in 1924 by Mariano Silva y Aceves, a member of Ateneo de la Juventud. Um, he was bonded to ethnography, anthropology, and literature, and so was the publication. And when referring to art, they prefer to represent not post-revolutionary things, but viceroyal times, religious architecture, architecture uh, colonial cities, or pre-Hispanic times, referring to culture and indigenism. And um, Andrea follows, in particular, the work of two women journalists, Josefina Sendejas, a poet concerned about representing homeland and patriotic definitions that one could say nowadays that Contrary writes in some level, La Suave Patria de López Velarde. It was more an essay or a manifest, more than a poem, the writings about the patria. And the main interest character for um, Andrea is Alba Herrera Yogazón. That's a 19th century musicologist, one of the first ones, who wrote the book El Arte Musical in Mexico. It was published 1917. She had a conservatory, conservatory perspective? Perspective of the conservatory. A perspective of the conservatory. Uh, she studied classic music, and so she didn't appreciate in, uh, especially regional music. And um, from the point she started publishing in this uh, Conozca Usted a Mexico magazine, she started to look to the regional and folk, uh, folklore uh, representations in music and dances and tried to describe and study uh, dances such as Wapango, and she documented that. So it was a kind of a popular twist for her in this medicine, which is also interesting by knowing and continuing on women journalists or women editors, then we have the third part of the book, the part concerning Mexico and the US, where Michael Schussler, a uh, scholar in Juan, in Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana, Cojimalpa, um, studied Francis Tour, this American editor and researcher resident in Mexico since 1922, who decided to uh, start the first cultural bilingual publication, Artes, uh, Mexican Folkways. And um, she was forced, at, uh, it seems at first she didn't want to publish it uh, bilingual, bilingual, but uh, she had this uh, sponsor by Secretaría de Educación Pública, by Manuel Gamio, and they were uh, on the sponsorship only if it was also in Spanish. So it started. And Tour worked with Diego Rivera as co-editor, and they uh, founded this uh, amazing, successful uh, publication, who was published every two to three months from 1925 till 1937, and with a gap in 1931. 
and um, they wanted to, she wanted more, the magazine to be used as a student's learning material for Spanish, for instance, and uh, to teach uh, folklore and Indian studies, not only uh, uh, the language, but also the knowing of the, of the life country. And um, after that, she continued as an editor and published um, tourist guides on Mexico as a motorist guide to Mexico in 1938, and an art book, Mexican Popular Arts, 1939, and a treasury of Mexican folkways, 1947. As we see, and uh, as we will see, the political opposition between the US and the Mexican post-revolutionary governments had its counterpart on cultural interests and intellectual efforts on both sides of the, of the, of the border. border. <laughs> Uh, Leopoldo Peña, who was also our, our fellow, um, explores a transnational iconography of Lázaro Cárdenas between 1934 and 1938, in, both in U.S. New Masses and Mexican Frente a Frente. The collaboration was between two men who were in contact, Enrique Gutmann, uh, or Heinrich Gutmann, a uh, German exilated uh, collaborator, photographer, um, who was the main photograph of Lázaro Cárdenas those years, and who pictured him as a hero, and sometimes also as a teacher, because the teacher figure was especially prestigious of those days, thinking after the Civil War, it was important to show a cultural uh, formation for the new country, and so teachers were a metaphor of what uh, revolution wanted from the intellectuals. And Joseph Freeman, one of the founders of New Masses, visited Mexico several times, and uh, decided that General Cárdenas could be a role model for American workers, instructing readers, and uh, Mexico should be then a uh, utopia for both sides of the border. So they were combining in the publications proletarian literature, journalistic efforts, and photographic production under anti-fascist postulates of the American Writers' Congress of 1935 and Congreso de Artistas y Escritores de Mexico, 1937. And uh, they wanted to make it by the one, the photographer, Goodman, straight photography, which is a concept um, about with producing photography without mechanical intervention or technical tricks. So letting the truth emerge, because that was important. Truth was a main concept. And Cardenas was painted as a heroic and pedagogic character by both. Remediation worked also between both publications, since Goodman took the pictures. And in New Masses, they made drawings on these pictures. And uh, they were also responding to extreme right campaigns anti-leftist uh, uh, anti and anti-Cardenas. And moving backwards, the last one of this part, which may be the most interesting in terms of Texas, is a Cutler's study on Mexican press in the US. After the Mexican Revolution, new publications were founded by exiliated people sometimes on this side by Mexican politicians, intellectuals in the 1910s. 
Los Ángeles, Regeneración, en el Heraldo de México, San Francisco, Hispanoamericano, Kansas City, El Cosmopolita, San Antonio, La Prensa, Santa Fe, El Tiempo. Y eh, reads all these publications and decides to pick up some examples. And um, what was important to, for him was to underline that uh, the literary section of El Cosmopolita presents uh, didactical short stories and poems, which were more sonetos y cuentos modernistas, with the difference between modernista and vanguardista, because modernist in English should be avant-garde, and modernista para nosotros, for us, is symbolist. So, uh, authors as Salvador Díaz Mirón, José Juan Tablada, in his first uh, writings, Enrique González Martínez, Ricardo Arenales, uh, signed as Porfirio Barba Jacob, but also Amado Nervo, José Santos Chocano, José Asunción Silva, were um, the poets referred, published in Spanish, and that would be anachronistic if we think this lasted till the 1920s and there was no variation onto the avant-garde. <coughs> but he thinks this is misread because um, most American uh, critics who have studied these publications, these uh, Mexican-American publications, didn't think of um, the difference between modernist and modernista. So they were preferring the examples written in English originally, and they didn't study uh, other authors like Cosme Damian or uh, Isabel Diaz, who published in El Cosmopolita and were already Mexican American writers, and they ex, uh, explored the living <coughs> between nations, same with the struggles of the working class heroes. For instance, a short story, Los Hijos de la Colorada, are, uh, is presented, from Cosme Damian, is presented, and the narration goes on the Mexican workers for constructing the train and the Trumps, American Trumps, um, disregarding them and thinking they were thieves. And uh, at the end, you see the Colorado is a dog, and that dog uh, has stolen the shoes of the Trumps and they were claiming that on uh, the Mexican workers. So that's just the first part of the book, and I will be glad to continue talking about. Now Amy is I'm come. next. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, I'm really delighted by the invitation to get to talk about this project again. I was also extremely excited to be invited to this collaboration. It's been five years um, that we were meeting. We had two wonderful in-person encuentros, uh, one in California, one in Mexico City at La UNAM. Um, and really, it's been a, a wonderful experience to meet other colleagues and learn about their work and a truly interdisciplinary project. <coughs> I'm going to agarrar algo de agua. I'm a little bit sick from in the airplane, so I hope my voice will hold out. So, um, and the momentous book that you, some of you are looking at um, as it gets passed around, is the product of all the work and a testament to the vision, really the long-term vision of two exceptionally insightful scholars and editors. They did a magnificent job with bringing it all together um, and brought us all together. So I was, I was excited <clears throat> because as it was proposed to me in that email invitation, 
This project has a simultaneous respect for archival work that's very deep and fruitful and difficult, very difficult, um, alongside an interdisciplinary and comparative focus that really felt right up my alley. Um, and it was great to be able to collaborate with others. So I work on, um, most recently, on seriality. Actually, I've been working on seriality since my dissertation. And um, I have a book coming out. Uh, it's called, as Adela told us, it's uh, Serial, Serial Mexico, Storytelling Across Media from Nationhood to Now. So it's really a panorama. And I do have, have a brief plug, just the cover. Um, it's coming out in June. The formatting as it passed to this computer, you lost a little bit, but this is the blurb on Amazon, so if you're interested, you can look it up there. But the point I want to make here is that I came to the newspaper comics that I talk about in the chapter out of this larger interest in how um, stories can be shared in small doses over a long period of time in a sequential format. And it occurred to me that a lot, I started off as a 19th century scholar, really so much of the literature that I was now reading in these massive tomes and book format was read completely differently in the moment in which it was issued, right? And, and really had the power in small doses to establish relationships with readers um, in the sense that certain characters and storylines were followed, consumed over time, and became very intimately known to readers. And I wanted to explore that more. Um, so this phenomenon of seriality is very robust in Mexico. And um, hopefully my book uncovers that perspective and allows Mexico to assume a place uh, in, in the history of seriality that's really quite very, is very important. In fact, um, Mexico's first novel um, was published as pamphlets. So it really started at the very beginning with Jose Joaquin Fernandez de Lizardi. But so I, in my book I talk about how seriality engaged readers and listeners from pamphlets to, in the end, in the 21st century, we still have a few telenovelas, and we have blogs and podcasts, which are episodic. So what I was interested in was looking about halfway through this panorama at comics. And I wasn't sure, when is it that in Mexico, again, very robust comic industry, right, in Mexico, especially in the 1960s. When was it that this, this type of storytelling really began to, to take off? Um, and I'm going to skip a couple of slides. Um, I just had a picture here for you. It's a little cut off, but these were the bound pamphlets of that first novel, which was El Periquillo Sarmiento, which um, remains popular somewhat to this day. It's got some Facebook pages and some, some blogs also and is read by so many, right? But it was issued sequentially. Um, so out of these conversations um, with different scholars, I, I came across a work um, which some of you will know. It's by Juan Manuel Aurecoechea. It's called Puros Cuentos, right? And so he establishes the long line of history of the comic in Mexico. And again, I might skip around a little bit, but here we have his book. Um, and this was just the first volume, right? I think there are two more after this. But um, he goes from 1874 to 1934. And up until the character that I'm interested in, you know, there's from 1874 to 1921. And the reason I, I became interested in this particular figura, perdón, estoy al revés, this, this particular character, Don Caterino, is because this was, according to Juan Manuel, in my conversations that I later got to have with him in Mexico City, this was the first figure that um, had a through line of narrative, right? In the very beginning of his, um, of his strip, at first it was sort of episodios sueltos, there was not much connection, and then there began to be a through line that um, became very fruitful, and so this character really took off, and the newspaper was El Heraldo de México. Um, began in 1919, so about two or three years into the paper was when the character began to, to take off. And so I was interested in, in really, in this project allowed me to do this, 
really delving into what were the circumstances and the source of the interest that generated a character that really survived until the 60s, right, um, in different uh, newspapers. And so this was how I came to Don Caterino. And so in, in my chapter, which is somewhat of a case study, I go into detail on this figure in the early years. And um, I look over most of his iterations, the iterations of this comic in the publication's first decade, so from 1921 to the end of the decade, trying to explain his appeal, because I did believe that he was a figure whose popularity merited sustained um, study and analysis. So the appearance is situated of the comic strip, which is the comic strip as a whole is called Don Caterino and his formidable family is situated in the years right after the armed conflict ended. Um, it was a very progressive paper. Uh, the founder was Salvador Alvarado, um, who was very soon after he founded the paper assassinated. He was considered a threat for the presidential elections. Um, and it, it appeared um, in 1919, as I mentioned, but was forced to close in 1923 when election-related rebellion which was La Rebelión de la Huertista, um, caused the paper to shut its doors and cease publication. And Don Caterino at that point was going really strong. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, you're you're going to tell me when I get to the, Okay, because <laughs> I can go on and on about this. Um, so we know that the strip was so captivating to the public in Mexico City that as soon as, as um, El Heraldo closed, it would jump to another paper. And this happened several times um, over subsequent decades that he just was not, he would jump to one paper to the next when there would be censorship or difficulties. Um, from El Heraldo at the end, in 1923, Don Caterino jumped to a paper with a more national reach, which was El Democrata, where it stayed until the end of that decade. And so it went until the early 60s, most regularly associated with El Nacional, where it spent almost three decades. So what was the source of such continued interest and intrigue with the public? What was the storytelling potential behind this figure, and that was really what I was looking at in the origins. So um, this was a family strip, and it's important that it came up in 1919, I'm sorry, 1921, because um, since the early teens in the United States, the family strip had been very, very popular, right? So there were, there were strips such as The Doings of the Duffs, Mr. and Mrs., um, The Bungle Family, which were precursors later of like, such as Family Circus. Some of you may be familiar with those family strips. This was a whole phenomenon. And um, in, in the 1920s, these strips were imported into Mexico and consumed very happily by the Mexican public. However, um, at this point in time, there were some interruptions due to La Guerra Cristera and other issues that were, were were bubbling up in the countryside, different rebellions, different um, un unrest, and it was difficult because of these, these moments of unrest to import these strips. And so Salvador Pruneda, who was the caricaturist in charge of El Heraldo Sunday Supplement, which was already very popular, got together with his editorial crew and they proposed to make their own family strip. And this is what came out of that. Um, so he drew the first version of the character, which you see here, and you can tell that he is he is a comic version of the Mexican charro, the Mexican cowboy, um, who's also a pater familias. He's the patriarch of, of a family that moves from Silao, Silado, Guanajuato, in this period after the revolution to Mexico City, and tries to establish his family under very difficult conditions in, in that city. And so he was very rough around the edges. Um, he recurred to his pistola, as you can see here, and was quite violent at his, in his beginnings out of frustrations that he felt upon arriving in Mexico City. He was well out of his milieu. Um, and maybe this is a good moment just to bring up a little bit about the charro in this period. Um, so, you know, here we have the comic version and make this go in the right way. This is the one of the first, um, this is the strip as it, it wasn't the first iterations. The first iterations are rather hard to find and I'll t hopefully have time to talk a little bit about that, but this is the family experiencing a, a circus venue and how you know they'd never been exposed to these types of spectacles and how they would get confused and very comic. And here's the, here are the members of the family. Um, 
You've already seen that one. And I also wanted to just mention that another part that was formative about this is it was very clearly an influence on Gabriel Vargas when he um, started La Familia Burrón, which is, was actually sketched earlier than a lot of people account for. It usually says 1948 in the history, but it was much closer, sort of towards the end of the decade where um, Don Caterino had really taken off. So very similar. And here's Salvador Pruneda with his, with his characters in El Heraldo. Um, but the charro in this period, I mean, it was part of this idea that the rural somehow needed to be integrated with the urban. And I, I just pointed, I point this out in my article because right after some of the iterations of, of Don Caterino end, the memoirs of Pancho Villa are published in, in, their, in their place. So there's kind of a, an assimilation, and when you know more about Caterina's story, you'll see this, but Pruneda had an idea behind this, and he, he thought that by characterizing the charro, he made him in some ways more understandable and less threatening, right? So here are his words. He, he penned his, his doctrine in 1958, and part of that he talks about the charro. Certain representations in caricature do not seek to deride, but rather exalt the ideals or outstanding types of a society. For example, here we see the charro boasting of his bravery, clothing, and weapons, who is best brought to life through a caricature that personifies the most authentic expression of our national idiosyncrasies. And this was, Don Caterino was still being published in, in 1958 when he wrote this. Um, he also assumed that Caterino would, would need to be somewhat domesticated through his family life, but at the same time he would be understood as a great Mexican, patriotic, astute, brave, talkative, and rowdy. So these were some of his ideas behind presenting um, Don Caterino. So what I wanted to do again in this article, this chapter, was really get to the bottom of these early exploits. And I had to go, I had to go into the archives of the Biblioteca Lerdo de Tejada. And it took me really, it took me every afternoon during the weekday for a whole summer to get through four years of, 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 I'm sorry, yeah, three years of publications. And that was because, and this is one of the most interesting things about this figure, it was much, it became much more than a strip, a uh, comic strip. So you could find the strip being announced before it appeared, but then in the months after it appeared, it proliferated, it, it, it reproduced itself in so many areas of the paper. It was so remarkable. So I was really having to look through almost every page of the paper and I would find so much about him. So he rapidly spilled over into, and I'll just show a few examples, advertising, and these are not chronological, they're more just the thematic. Um, he was used to sell light bulbs, medicines, um, uh, here's, uh, it's the same company, I think, but there are many. I just like the illustrations of these, thought that they were very um, llamativos. But so he also had, uh, again, like he would, he started off with his weekly supplement, in weekly Sunday supplement strip, but then there were um, more supplements, joke books, um, there was an advice column soon published. And, and then as the family starts to take trips around the world, there were things like they published the partitura of his foxtrot that he danced with his wife for the first time in New York. So they published this, and these were very prized possessions, I assume, by the readership. And so then very, again, like it's been, you know, a couple of years, it's starting to really heat up. He starts in to on top of, the, of the, the, the weekly strip. There's a daily memoir, right? So what's interesting here is that he starts out dictating these memoirs to his scribe, which is the pseudonym of the actual writer. But um, he, he goes on to become throughout this process an author um, towards the end of his memoirs, and he starts to write a history of Mexico. So I think what, what fascinated, and here's an illustration from the memoir, I can show you how, you know, visually they broke it down so that folks who were still not able to read could consume the storyline. There was a, a summary at the bottom, and then there was this very dense text written in vernacular um, that allowed readers of all levels of literacy to consume his story. This was, by now, you see how he became um, a writer of the history of Mexico. 
and I'm going to speed up a little bit because what what I came to understand very very quickly through this proliferation is that Don Caterino was much more than a caricature. He became a symbol of the need to integrate these elements of society into Mexico into Mexico's um, urban population through El Heraldo. And this was done, I mean, these basically his strip touches on many of the key political points of the recent revolution. The right of the common man to vote, his, his lema, his motto was um, the same motto that Francisco Madero had started the revolution with. He repeated it over and over again. His education, you know, in preparation for that suffrage, it shows how he becomes educated and also how he can take his place in, in the nation. And this is um, culminates in what's really a quite wonderful manifiesto because El Heraldo proposes him as a candidate for the presidency in the 1924 elections, which is, of course, a bit of a parody, but there, there was something really interesting in the way in which they, they proposed him, and part, these are part of the, um, part of the, the attributes that Don Caterino had acquired in his various trips and progressive domestication in Mexico City with his family. So um, there's a lot more to say about this, um, and if you are interested in hearing more, there is a book coming out in which a chapter goes into more of the manifestations through a longer time period, and it will be out in June. But in the meantime, I hope that everyone will will take a look at this book, which is for sale in the, in the, the digital bookstore, I think. We, we'll send you the link for the, for the book. You can order the book directly through the UNAM mm -hmm. virtual store. Mm -hmm. um, we hope we have more we, uh, yeah. copies, this but Jana print. could not bring a very, very heavy yeah. suitcase <laughs> <laughs> with books. What is the diapositiva del lente? What? La, la de, la de la de tu presentación. Regresa, regresa. Salir? Oh. No, regresa. Sí, otra, no, otra, 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 otra. Okay. Well, um, I, I don't want to talk too long because I really would like the audience to have time because I see that there are historians here and there are journalists, active journalists here as well, or who were journalists before becoming consuls. <laughs> um, but uh, what, what I want to say about um, the project, my insertion in the project, and thank you to Jana and Vivian and the group, is that mm, for me what was most interesting was to see the working of interdisciplinarity at a deep level, meaning with a very specific field, which was journalism and something else, right? Journalism and history, journalism and literature, journalism and visual culture. What did that mean to research of these individual scholars? In my case, which I thought was very interesting, was an, a, a different way to read classic literary texts. And what I learned by studying the press was not only how literature was read in the press, for which it has been, you know, many people have written about, but how our fields of perception were changing in this wave of modern times. And that means the way we look at things. And this illustration that Amy provided, for instance, when she was doing her research, showed me that reality, what we call the reality, was already seen through lenses. And that lens idea, that perspective, was remediated in the newspapers. So in the newspapers, you were already mediating reality through lenses and talking about literature. So my interest was in which way media interact. That was the idea of remediation. And they interact not only because you know one copy the other, but because they are teaching us new ways of seeing reality. And this has consequences in terms of aesthetics, 
but also in terms of politics, how we zoom in and who zoom out reality. What I did was study you know, classic poems, and the way they were read in the newspapers were already read as if they were uh, um, like a, a movie, also in a serial way, and how photography changed the very concept of symbolist poetry. Why the idea of the sublime that a poem in, that a symbolist had before photography could not be sustained. And in which sense that poem became mass entertainment. And this is kind of like the theoretical idea of my research. But it was based on very specific um, you know, entries in certain newspapers uh, like El Mundo Ilustrado, for instance, uh, in, in, in Mexico City. So um, just the idea of like how the press brings the here and now in so, many le in so many aspects and how we can make sense of our own corpus, the, the corpus that we do research with, in that coyuntura is what I think was great about this project. Um, that's what I can say. But I don't want to go into details, and I really would like um, you know, the audience <laughs> to engage, particularly for you, from your own fields. This is, I, I can say something about the period, right? Because during this period, we saw that we needed to go backwards, but also forwards. forwards. And forwards because the questions that we are asking about information and how information flows were already there at the beginning of the 20th century, and the first half of the 20th century. So, um, and the impact of a revolution. So I don't know if you have questions or comments from your own perspectives. Well, to start out, um, this is really interesting. I like comic books and caricature and stuff like that.